Hello, um, as Norma said, I'm Mike Jumper. I'm the CEO and lead developer of Gluptodon. Um, the Guacamole project was actually my project about 10 years ago, and then we formed uh, Gluptodon around that uh, and then donated it to Apache, where it now continues as the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, we continue to contribute, but uh, I, I serve mainly to provide support and development on the Glipidon side, and then I contribute upstream when I can. Uh, the point of this talk is to cover some of the main gotchas that people tend to run into when they're setting up guacamole, um, and then to point you in the right direction as far as, as setting things up are concerned for performance and, and with respect to security. Um, uh, we'll be going through an actual demo of how this is done um, with, uh, in, in this case, with the Glyptodon packages, but I'll, I'll be pointing to the upstream documentation and, uh, and referencing that as well. So you can see how this would be done if you're working strictly from uh, upstream source and, and releases. So to begin, uh, if, you're, if you're just starting things, uh, it's pretty common to uh, not want to look at the manual and it's understandable the upstream manual is fairly technical uh, and it's it's common when people haven't been who, people who aren't too used to things like tomcat or databases and to look at that and and be turned away by the learning curve uh, and there are tutorials out there that are simpler and that walk through things from start to finish and that even you could follow through just by copying and pasting commands, but you don't necessarily want to do that. We see a lot of activity in the mailing lists uh, with people being confused, mainly because they didn't go to the manual and instead went to a tutorial. Uh, the tutorials are helpful, but sometimes they're out of date. They have recommendations that point to properties and configuration things that are no longer even used uh, and that have no effect. They don't hurt anything by their being there, but they just serve to be confusing. Uh, the last thing you want to do is not consult the manual at all, which should be the most up-to-date and current documentation maintained by the project itself, and only look at a tutorial and move through that, uh, and then tie yourself into a knot. Uh, flailing wildly, changing permissions uh, until eventually things work, I mean, it might seem like that's a good idea, but then when you end up with the finished product and finally things are deployed, you're not going to know why it's working. And that's not a safe thing for something you want to deploy into production. So instead of doing that, uh, consult both the manual and the tutorial, not just the tutorial, or go to the manual alone. There are, there are instructions for how to build uh, from start to finish Guacamole server and then the web application component Guacamole client. If you are following a tutorial and, and it seems like things don't match up with what you're seeing in the manual, err on the side of the manual. The manual is current. Uh, if you still have issues and, and the manual is too confusing, the tutorial doesn't match, reach out to the upstream community. There's a mailing list, user at, at guacamole.apache.org. Uh, we can help you out there. And if you're a company and, and you need enterprise support, there are commercial support providers. Uh, the company that I work for. When you're moving from start to finish with deploying Apache Guacamole, even if you're not too technically familiar with what each point, what, what each particular component does, it's still important to keep in mind the actual stack and how it's designed. Since then, with with this particular, with these sets of components in mind, you you know in your head a, a to do a to do list that you can check off as you connect things together. Uh, with Guacamole, the stack is made up of mainly two components, the web app that runs underneath Tomcat, and then GuacD, which is a, a server-side daemon that, that handles the actual, actual remote desktop side of communication. It translates between the uh, actual remote desktop protocols, like RDP and VNC, and converts them into the Guacamole protocol, which is the main super protocol that Guacamole uses. Uh, in the client. GuacD handles things like optimization uh, and translation, whereas the web app can focus on just supporting that one main protocol. Uh, around Tomcat, uh, when, you're, when you have a production deployment, you would also have SSL termination uh, to provide encryption for the public-facing part of things. 
And then internally, the web app would be communicating with a database like MySQL or Postgres uh, in order to handle authentication uh, and storage of connection data. So that's really the four main components is you have Guacamole and GuacD, that's the actual Guacamole stack. And then you have Tomcat running Guacamole, the web app. And then you have SSL termination around that uh, that provides encryption and the, the database. There are other aspects to Guacamole as far as authentication is concerned. Uh, there are things like LDAP, uh, which might be useful if you're if you have Windows machines that you're connecting to, since there's a way to configure Guacamole to provide username and password pass through. Uh, and if your users authenticate using LDAP or Active Directory on the Windows side, this can make things very convenient since they'll only have one set of credentials and they won't have to enter it twice. Um, and there's a built-in authentication method called user mapping. But it's important to remember that the user mapping uh, user mapping.xml file is meant only for testing. It's not a production method. You can use it for small deployments. You can use it to verify that Guacamole works before you start setting up a database, but you don't want to actually use it in production. You should use the database in production. Uh, the database, besides being intended for production use, it provides benefits like a web interface, uh, administrative interface for creating connections, for granting access to different connections on a per user basis, things like that. The user mapping is, is just a straight XML file. When you're actually allocating resources, uh, we've actually done uh, load tests to verify how much, how many resources need to be allocated for particular loads. And we've found that it scales linearly with respect to the number of concurrent connections. So if you know ahead of time roughly how many people you expect to be connecting at peak, then you use that number to determine how many cores, how much memory you should allocate for GuacD. Uh, Tomcat, it makes virtually no difference, uh, but GuacD needs to do actual translation and optimization. It has to understand the RDP and VNC protocols and then convert them to something that the browser can understand and recompress the images it receives in ping and JPEG and WebP. Uh, so you need to keep in mind that this takes processing power and that it, it scales based on the number of people that are currently connected, not the overall number of users you have, but how many people are in the, in the session at any one time. Uh, for every 25 users, you can expect to need around one CPU core. Uh, so if you have users on the order of hundreds, that's you don't really need that many resources. Uh, a modest server can support quite a, a good number of concurrent users. If you start getting towards the thousands, you'll, you'd want to look towards load balancing around GuacD. Uh, so as far as uh, demonstrating how this will work, uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to be using the Glypton packages here, but I'll, I'll be pointing at the, the upstream documentation to give you an idea of what would be done if you're doing this with the upstream packages. It, it really is the same. Uh, the packages that I'm using, it's just going to be a bit simpler and, and faster for the sake of this presentation, but the, it is the same steps. We're going to be installing uh, Tomcat and Guacamole itself, followed by configuring a database, followed by uh, create, adding SSL termination, in this case, using Nginx. So I have a CentOS box already prepared uh, in AWS. I'll follow through the installation documentation here. This is the documentation that's on the Glypton website. Uh, if you're using the upstream uh, source and the upstream documentation, you'd be going to the latest release, which is 1.2.0, and to the manual. Uh, the installation documentation is here. Uh, for in particular, you'd want to install uh, whichever dependencies you need for the level of features that you're going to be preparing. Some things are required, not everything. Um, it depends on which protocols you want to support. Uh, once, once you have that in place and you have things built, you would be installing the web app. Uh, but on the Glypton side, the first step is to actually get access to the packages. So we'll do that here. credentials. 
and then we'll install guacamole itself. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and install Tomcat as well. That's the next step that would be following after this. The package group that's shown here, the guacamole package group, that contains the main uh, components of the guacamole stack. That's guacamole itself, as shown here, the guac D uh, daemon that handles their actual uh, remote desktop translation, and then the various supported protocols, in this case, VNC, RDP, and SSH. So this should be fairly quick. Uh, upstream, were you using, were you, if you just finished uh, compiling the Guacamole server source, which is what installing GuacD and, and the VNC RDP SSH plugins would be doing, um, you don't need to build the web app. You could just download it straight away. The important thing would be to prepare uh, installing Tomcat first and then deploying the WAR file. That's also covered in here in the actual deployment documentation. And within the Glyptodon packages, there is a guacamole group that guards access to the configuration files. Uh, I can show that in practice here that the group is owning uh, the default guacamole properties and user mapping the sensitive files of a guacamole deployment. Uh, so in order for Tomcat to actually be able to run the guacamole web app and for the guacamole web app to be able to access its own files, the Tomcat user, the, the Tomcat service user needs to be part of the guacamole group. Uh, if you were doing the upstream packages, the upstream source, whether you need to do this would depend on how you set it up. If you create a service user for Tomcat or if your distribution has created a service, a service user for Tomcat, uh, or if you choose to create uh, a guacamole group or to simply um, make a Tomcat owner of the files, all that matters is that it has read access. It doesn't need write access. To deploy the web application under Tomcat, there's a standard location where things will go. Uh, for the CentOS version of uh, the Tomcat package, that's varlib Tomcat web apps. Uh, I understand that's different for Ubuntu. So if you're using a different distribution or if, you're, if you've downloaded Apache Tomcat from upstream, you'll need to consult the documentation to see where the WAR file needs to go. Uh, in this case, we're making a symbolic link from where the package put the file uh, to the, the designated location as root.war. This, this will cause Tomcat to deploy the web app at the root of the web server rather than slash guacamole. Uh, with, with all that in place, uh, CentOS and Red Hat, they do not start services by default. I think that's a good thing. I think Ubuntu, they will start this by default. Um, we need to start these things manually. That would be the GuacD and Tomcat services, uh, and then configure things to run automatically at boot. And now, if I point my browser at this directly, uh, this should be working at the default Tomcat port. Do something wrong here. Oh, that's fine. Oh, that's a three. Okay, so we have the login screen here. This again, Glyptodon packages, it's been branded. If you were using the upstream packages, this would, there'd be a guacamole logo here. The version number would be slightly different. It's really the same thing. You'd see a username and a password prompt. You'd see a login button. Um, authentication hasn't been configured yet. So there's nothing I can do here, uh, but configuring that will be the next step. At least with this, we have verified that the web application is running. Uh, I'll continue on with configuring uh, MySQL. In this case, uh, I'll be using MariaDB since that's part of the CentOS repositories. You could use Postgres if you prefer Postgres. Uh, if, if you have a SQL Server instance already ready, that's supported as well. Uh, I'm using MariaDB here for the sake of a simple demo. Uh, 
as before, we need to start the service. This will not be happening by default. And allow it to start on boot. So theoretically, this is fine. MariaDB is running. We could use it for guacamole. Uh, before we do that, there is something else that needs to be needs to be done because MySQL is running locally. Uh, this is not a very well-known quirk, but MySQL by default contains um, anonymous users. I can show this within the, the MySQL prompt. These blank users here, the the one at the at the host name of this and at localhost, these blank users are anonymous users. And if you attempt to connect to MySQL using from one of these hosts uh, using a different account over TCP, which is what Guacamole will try to do, it won't work. It'll assume that you mean these, the password won't match, and it'll fail. Uh, we don't want anonymous users anyway. So, so long as we're running MySQL or MariaDB on the same server as Guacamole, we should delete these users uh, so that authentication can succeed. I will do that now. Just copy and paste this. Okay, now we can safely move forward. So to configure Guacamole to connect to this MySQL MariaDB instance, we need to install the extension. Uh, there's a standard location for this. You'll see this referenced in the upstream documentation. That's Etsy Guacamole extensions. Uh, the only extension here right now is the branding that came with the Glyptodon uh, packages. Normally, there'd probably be nothing here. You would you would be downloading the necessary package. Uh, in this case, the the Guacamole auth JDBC file, extracting it, and then copying the relevant jar. Uh, that's all listed inside the documentation. So the upstream documentation for this that would be here: database authentication. This walks through creating the database. Uh, as well as putting the, the uh, relevant extension in the proper location uh, and then setting the relevant properties. Uh, properties. So I'll move forward with that. On the Glyptodon side, there is a, a package that handles all of this. So if you, if you notice, this pulled in not just the MySQL uh, and MariaDB support, but also the JDBC driver for this. So we can now see that this is, this is in place and the required driver for being able to connect to MySQL, that's also been put in place. So with that there, the, the actual database that Guacamole will use, that needs to be created. Um, I'm going to just use the default values here. So Guacamole DB, uh, and then we'll use the provided SQL scripts that are within the, the schema directory, running those through. Uh, our root user does not have a password, so we'll get rid of that. Uh, these files, there's two of them, one for actually defining the schema and the other for creating the default admin credentials. This is done intentionally. Uh, the Guacamole is never granted more permissions than it needs uh, for the user that we're about to create. Uh, only, only read and write permissions to the tables within the database are granted. It doesn't have permission to manipulate the schema and it doesn't need permission so long as the admin is the one that creates and updates things. So going back in here, let's create the user. This is the service user that Guacamole will use to connect to MySQL. Um, in real life, you would want to set an actual reasonable password. I'm just going to copy this because it's easy and this is a demo. Um, in, if you were doing this in production, please set an actual secure password. Okay, so now at this point, we have a database. The database has been initialized. Guacamole has the extension installed. Uh, but it hasn't yet been configured to point at the database. It doesn't know where the database is running and it doesn't know what credentials it should use to access them. We need to edit Guacamole's configuration file. That's guacamole.properties uh, to tell it where all this is. Now the Glyptodon packages, they provided this um, 
placeholders and comments pointing things in the right direction. You don't, you don't need any of these values here. This is just for documentation. What you do need are the values shown here. Uh, that's the host name uh, and port for the database that's running uh, and the actual database name itself and the service user. These, these are the values that we just entered. Um, in the upstream documentation, you'll see this mentioned as well. You need the host name port, database name. So as long as these things are in place, it should be able to connect. Um, all we need to do now is reload Tomcat, restart Tomcat, so that it has this information loaded. Guacamole won't automatically load new extensions and it won't automatically reread guacamole.properties. You need to do this manually. Okay, so theoretically this would be fine. It won't be, I'm gonna show this failing because of SE Linux. This is good, Tomcat by default because of SE Linux and CentOS and Red Hat is not allowed to connect to a database. Uh, you need to change the SE Linux configuration to say that you want this to be allowed. Uh, that would be the Tomcat can network connect DB Boolean. If we set this, we should be good. Um, but this is, this is a factor if you're installing under CentOS and Red Hat. If you're installing on a platform that doesn't use um, that doesn't use SE Linux, you probably won't encounter this. Uh, so now we should be able to log in with the default credentials. As far as backend authentication is concerned, this is production ready. The only thing that's stopping us from using this as it stands would be that there's no SSL in front of it. Uh, you, you would want an actual domain name. You would want everything to go over HTTPS you wouldn't want to directly connect using this. So we'll go with the final step now and actually set up uh, SSL. So in this case, that's I'm going to use Nginx. That's what I'm most familiar with. Um, I happen to find it easier to configure than the Apache web server, just because the configuration files make more sense to me. They're very C-like, uh, but it's really, you can use whatever you prefer. There's instructions available for both Apache and Nginx. Uh, you need to enable the EPEL repository if you're using CentOS or Red Hat. That's what I did here. Uh, Nginx is available, but it's not part of the CentOS or Red Hat repositories by default. So I'll install Nginx now. And then once that's done, we'll do the same start and enable so that this service is running uh, and so that it starts automatically on boot. Now, as a quick peek, um, the two things that we're gonna be doing here for SSL termination are one, making sure that when you're connecting, you get redirected to SSL if you're not already using it. So anything coming in over port 80, we want to still accept those connections, but we then send a redirect back to tell them to connect using HTTPS on port 443. And then for any connections that are coming over HTTPS, they need to be passed through with Nginx removing the encryption part and passing through the unencrypted part of the connection internally to Tomcat. So first off, we'll create the redirect. Um, the default configuration for Nginx uh, on CentOS looks like this. This will conflict. That's this location block will conflict with the uh, the part of the redirect that we're going to be doing later. So step one is going to be to comment out all of that default configuration. So I'll do that real quick here. and then create the necessary redirect. So this, this is fairly straightforward, this particular file. All, all we're doing here is telling Nginx to listen on port 80 for unencrypted HTTP connections and for any that come in, issue, issue a redirect, a 301 moved permanently redirect uh, for the same exact host and request, but for HTTPS. And then we'll reload Nginx so it has the new config. Now, at this point, 
if I go to engine, if I go to port 80, uh, just as it is, this should fail, but this fails in a good way. Uh, what the reason this is failing now is because nothing is listening on port 443. It's been redirected. Uh, it's been correctly redirected from port 80 to port 443, but there's nothing there. So this part, the redirect part is working. We now need to configure the rest. Uh, for SSL, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use Let's Encrypt. I've set up a domain ahead of time so that this can work. Uh, I set up ato.glyptodon.com. Um, you would need your own domain. If you have an existing certificate authority, you would use that. Um, the CertBot tool that we need for Let's Encrypt, that's part of CentOS and Red Hat repositories. So I'll pull that in. And then once, if since we're using Let's Encrypt, uh, it's important to keep in mind that the web the web root pl uh, sorry the web root plugin, uh, which is what we'll be using for the SSL here uh, for verifying that we control the domain, it works by having Let's Encrypt ping us back over HTTP and reading the contents of a directory called dot well known. Um, if we don't change the redirect that we just created to allow the contents of the of WebRoot to be read um, from dot well known. If we don't add an exception, then Let's Encrypt is just going to get a redirect to HTTPS and that's not going to work. Uh, we need to modify what we just created uh, with Let's Encrypt in mind and make sure that this is something that will work. So all we're doing here is adding an exception uh, since Let's, Nginx will interpret this first, uh, telling it to serve the contents of dot well known within this directory, the standard web root for Nginx, only for requests here, for everything else redirect them. And then if we reload Nginx, we should have enough, enough available for Let's Encrypt to grant us our certificates. So I'll go ahead and do that. I've already pointed the ato.glyptodon.com domain that I mentioned uh, at the IP address, the public IP address of this server. Uh, obviously, if, if you were doing this uh, with your own domain, uh, then you would, you would need to do that ahead of time. Enter my email. Yes, I agree. Uh, no, thanks. Okay, so now we have uh, a full certificate and private key granted from Let's Encrypt for the domain that I created. Uh, we need to configure Nginx to actually use these certificates. Uh, to do that, we'll create another file. Uh, in this case, I'll call it guacamole.conf. Uh, and this one will actually be using uh, the SSL certificates. So this should look familiar. This is almost identical to the to the the block that we had before, except that this one is using the standard HTTPS port and it's telling Nginx to use SSL. There's a placeholder here for the location block that will proxy the connection. I'll just omit that for now since we can test without it. Um, let me remove this placeholder because our domain is different. Okay, so that should be good. Uh, if if you were doing this in production, um, you should also you would also want to set, configure automatic remove, renewal using cron. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want this to actually renew. I'm going to revoke the certificate shortly after this demo. Uh, but you you could do this uh, following the recommendations of Let's Encrypt by having something that runs daily that reruns CertBot daily. Um, this script is here as, as an example for what you would do. So you, you would create a cron job that every day attempts to renew. And if the attempt is successful, reloads Nginx to pull in the new certificate. So that, that much is pretty simple. Okay, so theoretically, uh, if I reload Nginx now uh, and I point things here, 
I should see. I should see the default uh, web root. This is okay. This is expected. We haven't yet configured Nginx to use uh, the the proxy portion to actually proxy guacamole as uh, as it would need to for SSL termination. Uh, but this is confirmed that we at least have SSL working. Now we need to actually connect the pieces. And for that, it's really just one more location block. Uh, this, once we add this and, and correct this placeholder um, uh, within the, the, uh, the placeholder that's here, this will tell Nginx to, instead of serving web root, the default web root, uh, to proxy connections to the internal service hosted at localhost 8080. Uh, which in our case is guacamole. Now, if I were to do this right now, uh, again, SE Linux is going to get in the way because of the uh, HTTPD and Nginx are not going to be allowed to connect over the network internally. Uh, we need to tell SE Linux that this is something we actually want to happen. Otherwise we would receive a proxy error Like that. Okay, so now everything is set up. Uh, this is a, at this point, production deployment. Uh, if I go to ato.glutron.com, you can see that everything is correct. We no longer get complaints from Chrome that this is failing. It's a valid certificate. Uh, we can sign in using the, the default credentials and all is working. Um, for the sake of a, a demo, I'll, I have a connection prepared, so I'll show how this actually works in practice. Um, I'll create a Windows connection, uh, an RDP connection to a Windows machine. set this up ahead of time. And we're using NLA and it's a self-signed certificate. That looks correct. Um, beware of these values. It's fairly common for people to accidentally put the host name and port of their connection here this is for configuring non-default uh, guac D locations. You don't need to change this. The parameters for the connection are below. There you go. So this is actually working. This is an RDP connection over guacamole. Um, if you were to do this yourself, following these exact same steps, you would end up with what's considered a production deployment. Obviously you would change uh, resources allocated if you don't need uh, as beefy a server or if you need a beefier server. Uh, but as long as you have um, half an hour to an hour of time and you can follow through these steps, you can have this set up. All you need is, is a domain, uh, SSL, an SSL certificate and some patience. So going back here. Um, as far as guacamole goes, uh, we think it really is the best thing that you could use, especially given the current uh, state of the pandemic and the need for remote access. Uh, it really simplifies things. And as far as providing a good experience, it should accelerate uh, the performance of the remote desktop beyond what you would normally expect because of the way that GuacD handles recompression. Um, and if you're a commercial entity or you're a company that needs additional support, uh, you can always reach out to us at Glyptodon. Uh, we have the necessary experience and we have packages that make this uh, easier to maintain and install and for which you would get updates. Uh, and if you have any problems, you can always reach out to us and we can provide support. So thanks. Um, if, we, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll take them now, uh, or you can always come back to us later uh, at the, at the Glyptodon booth and we can take your questions there. Uh, I've posted uh, inside of the slides links to all the relevant documentation that uh, 
we just created, uh, that, we, that we just walked through, as well as the documentation that corresponds to this upstream. Uh, and that's in the slides. Uh, so if you, um, I, I believe uh, All Things Open is making these slides available. If you download the slides, uh, that can point you in the right direction, uh, as would the, the recording of this talk. Okay. I don't. Oh, I see some things in the chat. Uh, Klaus Landsdorf has asked, is there some restriction to do all the steps with a pod for a pod man or Docker? You could make it much easier. Guac D maybe outside the pod and the rest inside the pod. Yeah, okay, I see you found it. Yeah, there is there is Docker documentation. Um, I can, let me just open that up. Okay, so on this side. So on the Glyptodon side, there's documentation for deploying using Docker. So yes, if you prefer Docker, that's that's something you can do. Um, we we also have not provide images for the database uh, upstream on the on the Apache side. Uh, there's there are images too. There's installing using Docker. So yeah, if you prefer Docker, you can definitely go that route. Anything else? Okay. 